Hello and welcome to this BFI at Home discussion on the new YouTube original commission, The Outsiders, which you can see on YouTube from the 4th of October. I'm Akria Jamfi, founder of the British Blacklist, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to discuss this powerful six-part documentary series, which has been spearheaded by the director, Simon Frederick, and which paints a raw and unfiltered picture of life in today's society as a person of colour. Through intimate, frank interviews, we hear how these young Black people are turning the tables on the very same society that initially rejected them, fighting back against the status quo and overcoming adversity to become the luminaries of our time. The series features a dazzling lineup of YouTube creators, actors, artists, musicians, creatives and authors from the UK and across the globe. And we are absolutely thrilled to have some of them here with us now. So I'm going to introduce everybody and um, yeah, we'll get into the conversation. So first up, we have the series creator and director, Simon Frederick. Simon is an artist, a photographer, a filmmaker and a broadcaster. He conceived and directed and produced the award winning four part series, Black is the New Black for the BBC. And also his, the portraits that he shot of his subjects during the filming of the show were acquired by the National Portrait Gallery, becoming the largest acquisition of portraits of African Caribbean sitters in the gallery's history. His follow up series, They've Got to Have Us, which charts the revolutionary rise of black artists in film, was another critically acclaimed hit. And he has been named in the annual power list as one of the UK's 100 most influential black people. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice, no, wonderful. And next up, we're going to have, we're going to introduce Campbell Addy, who is a London-based photographer and filmmaker, born and raised in South London. His work follows unique narratives with a focus on distinctive casting and underrepresented faces. Hello, Campbell. Hi. Hello, everyone. Following Campbell, we have Chidera Igaru, who is an author of the number one Sunday Times bestseller, What a Time to Be Alone, and how to get over a boy, otherwise known as slum flower. Hello, Tadira. Hello, thank you so much, so much for having me. Grateful to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. And last but definitely not least, we have the wonderful Vernon Francois, the British-born Los Angeles-based celebrity hairstylist, educator at L'Oreal's Redkin, and global inclusivity and education advisor for L'Oreal brand Kera Stars. So I want to welcome you. Hello, Vernon. I'm so delighted to be here with you all. Thanks for having me. And welcome to you all. This is, um, I'm really excited to speak to you because I um, have, after seeing some of the series, um, I can definitely say I was inspired, um, emotional, <laughs> and really empathized with the story that's been told in this series. And what's unique about this is that it's a British, we've got British voices, we've got international voices, and we're coming together to share our common stories, which is something that we don't get to do very often. So starting with you, Simon, what was your main purpose and intention of this series? Well, my main purpose and intention of the series was to, to highlight something that, um, that I've been an admirer of for a long time, and that is um, Black people who are under 40. Um, I think that these generations have created things that simply have never existed before, have professions that never existed before, and are pushing our culture forward and connecting uh, from continent to island to continent again uh, in ways that black culture has never been connected before and doing it in a way that is not just affecting black culture but affecting all of our cultures as human beings. So I really wanted to, I'm inspired by the younger generations and what they've done, how they've done it, how they're not taking no for an answer and creating their own yeses. And for me, I really wanted to show them and allow them, you know, just basically be a conduit uh, for other people to get to see what I see, uh, but not to be in the way of this documentary at all and allow them to tell their own stories in their own way. And you touched on the fact that it's international um, and global conversation. Why, why was that important? Because I think, especially when you grow up in the UK, we grow up in awe of our cousins overseas in America, and then we have our familial roots in Africa or the Caribbean, but those conversations never merge and blend. It's like we're very othered, even though we have such common stories. So why was that? And, and, and this is a kind of repeated theme in your past previous projects as well. They've got to have us and black as a new black. Um, why is this this thing, why is this so important to you? And why deliver it on YouTube? 
Um, I think why why it was really important to me is because I think that you know my my parents came to the UK from the Caribbean, and when they came from the Caribbean, they came from the island of Grenada. They didn't know anyone who came from Barbados. They'd never met anyone who came from Nigeria. You know, in terms of a black community, you know, people talk about the black community as if we are one, you know, monolithic group, uh, a homogenous group, and we're not. You know, we're we're probably the most diverse diaspora on the planet. You know, and um, through social media. Uh, and within the last 10 years through, you know, ostensibly YouTube in particular, those connections have come together in ways that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. You know, uh, people, you know, people, Afrobeat stars connecting with, with reggae stars, connecting with hip hop stars, connecting with, you know, it's like there's just this interconnectivity now of our culture uh, in ways that I never thought. and. You know what's what's really exciting about this show is that we don't just get to talk about it we see the living examples of that with the people's work you know someone like vernon you know working you know with international stars from you know from uganda to la to you know from all over the world you know campbell you know uh, uh shooting the poster for for queen and slim you know and connecting with lena Waite you know, um, Chidera writing a book in Ibo, you know, which is, which is being, you know, uh, celebrated by, by Oprah Winfrey on her book club, you know, and, you know, has Victoria Beckham reading Ibo Proverbs, you know, it's like, we, we are touching people in so many different ways uh, with our culture. Um, and for the first time, I think, you know, these generations that we're celebrating within this show, they're owning that, you know, no one can take that away from them. Absolutely. Uh, times have changed from the early, from my days of um, being insecure about being African in a Western space and define, like asserting myself as who I was. For, the, for you guys, um, Chidera, Campbell and Vernon, why did you say yes to being involved in this? And I feel like it's an obvious one. This is a great project to say yes to. But personally, when you heard or saw the kind of spec and the outline, what attracted you to this and made you say, yeah, this is an important conversation to be a part of? I'll start with Chidera. For me, I felt compelled to be involved because I strongly believe that we all have a part to play in the revolution and every individual's role will look different to each other's. And I believe that through having these conversations, we can ignite a spark in someone else and that spark can turn to action. And I believe strongly that with this YouTube um, piece that's been made, it's really going to encourage people to see that we all start somewhere and none of us have started in the perfect position that we ever imagined we would have started at. So I wanted to be the proof that no matter where you started, there's potential for that to become something. What people don't understand is everybody is empowered when black people are empowered. When you are marginalized and the world has been built in a way that prevents you from maneuvering it with ease, then it means that only those who have the ability to access it benefit from that. But when you release all those barriers and you make it accessible for everyone, then everyone wins. For me, it's about never taking your foot off the gas and remembering who thrives when you hate yourself and allowing the life you have on this earth to be a love letter to your blackness. That's amazing. And Vernon, being that you're a British born LA based creative, why was it important for you to join this international global conversation? Well, if you know Simon, then you, he doesn't take no for an answer. So, you know, it was more like him calling me and saying, I need to speak to you. I was like, okay, great, I'll speak with you. And then, you know, as one visionary to another visionary, when someone starts to articulate their aspirations, you align with that because each and every one of us in this particular series uh, sits in that space uh, with such gravity 
uh, and there's very few of us that really stand in that space strong as we are. So when you hear someone really exploring all of the greatness of what ifs and what we can do and what we have done, uh, it was a no-brainer to align myself with whatever it is he wanted me to be a part of. And so it was just logistically figuring out how we could make that happen as we're sitting here today. I cannot remember a time when I haven't celebrated Afro kinky hair type. I grew up in a household where hair was a big part of the culture. My mum and my father wore locks. It was something that they found was sacred to the culture that we were in, but also it was a way in how the hair naturally just thrived. And so to lead my curiosity outside of the house into this world and then to hear and see all these negative words and reactions towards uh, the black woman's hair was really and still is perplexing to me. Often women were sitting in a salon really trying to figure out how to be their most beautiful when, when their hair is wet and curly. And I'll be like the biggest fan going, oh, this is amazing, this is beautiful, let's wear it like this, let's do that. And they'll be like, no, we've got to have it straight. And I'll be like, why? Why are you not seeing what I'm seeing? I just got tired. And so I made it my life's mission to flip the narrative. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, a lot of things have to shift. And that starts with uh, education. Uh, and it starts with the institutions. And it starts by having a seat at the table and having a conversation and more conversations and then giving perspective. And Campbell, you know, you shot the poster for one of the most iconic films in our film lexicon and with two British black stars leading and uh, telling a black American story that, you know, had such an impact for us all. Why did you say yes? Did Simon twist your arm? No, it's weird. I would say it was more of a spiritual connection. When me and Simon connected, it was very strange. It was as if I was seeing the future and the past in a physical form and vice versa. So then when it came about for the outsiders, I was just excited to be spoken about or have a label that wasn't necessarily based on accolades, areas I'd grown up, because a lot of things I've been a part of is like, you're black, you're queer or this. And I'd always call myself a floater. I'd always call myself an outsider. And I loved the way Simon and I would have these long conversations that would just turn into trees of organicness. I don't know how to explain it. And I thought, okay, if we're going, if he's going to do a project, of course I'll say yes. And also I was, I was excited to see where Simon would take me as an outsider in seeing someone who I almost see my future in. I wanted to see, okay, what insight and what questions would he, on what roads would he lead me down? And, and of course it's Simon. I don't know if I can say no. <laughs> I mean, who says no to Simon, to be honest? And I understand about those conversations bearing trees and fruit and branches and roots, because it's just, sometimes you don't get, sometimes I feel like, especially if you work behind the scenes, especially, you don't get to have those conversations that really anchor and validate the work that you're doing, why you're doing it and stuff like that. So sometimes having those personal conversations that then can bear fruit and be on screen and share to the world, I think that's really important and powerful. What I wanted to know for you guys is what did you, what did this conversation with Simon reveal about yourself? Because there's only so much that can go into the actual final product. However, I know that it wasn't just like a half an hour conversation. I'm sure there was extensive footage that Simon had to trawl through to pick out. But what did you learn about yourselves? Like a self-realization? Oh, um, well, I haven't seen anything yet. So I don't know what is put in there about myself, but um, as our relationship has developed, um, the one thing that is very consistent with Simon that I, I find a rarity in the spaces that I operate in is the willingness to feel, to allow you the space to feel safe around him. So whatever you give to him content-wise, it's there to be celebrated and to amplify all the strengths um, in how you became to be how you are. Um, and I say that because he knows some of the conversations I've had where he's really wanted to delve into a lot of insight of who I am and how I've become to who I am today. And I've been very like, mm, let me just hold on to this data because, you know, once you hand it over to someone, it's then somebody else's IP. And we all know our 
IP has been taken and ravished it in a way that really um, undermines our ability as humans to thrive in a world that essentially is now being told that we're not we're not worthy of anything and actually everything that everyone has become worthy of is because of the foundations that we've actually crafted ourselves with our bare hands and so for me I, i'm learning still in real time uh, that if you have true allyship uh, it's okay and that's what i've been sort of battling with and i, I think there are good people out there i know there are good people out there uh, and i believe Sam is one of those for me i feel like the moment I walked on set and went to sit to have my makeup done, I already felt the energy and there was so much that I was discussing while in my makeup chair that even the content we managed to actually create when we were on set and rolling, like it's just, it's just a very encompassing energy. And I feel as well, like what was really important for me was that there were black faces in the room behind the camera. The makeup artist was a black woman. And that for me was super key to the point where I remember when I looked at the call sheet, I, I made a phone call and I was like, I just want to double check. Is this a black makeup artist? Because if it's not, I wouldn't want to be involved. And I was happy to get that confirmation because those things matter. And I think we all have a role to play in advocating for each other, even when no one is looking. So I want people to know that what you're seeing on screen is powerful, but even behind the screen, there's so much power as well. I think it was from the moment I walked into the studio and obviously me and Simon have spoken before about like how I run my sets, how he runs the sets. He's, we spoke about like, even though we're years apart, we've had like mirroring situations happen in our career. And I remember thinking, I'm not gonna be emotional when I get to set with Simon. I'm gonna be professional. I'm not gonna talk about my past. Lord, that went out the window as soon as I got on set. It was a sense of safety that I, haven't, I hadn't ever experienced in an interviewing process. And then I just found myself being okay to talk and not worrying that, oh, if I leave this information in, on these digital screens that are recording it, and I'm, I'm going to scream and regret it later. And then after doing the interview, I kind of didn't realise in my life that I had, I hadn't grown or leaned into my otherness in terms of like being outside of my social group, outside of like my queerness. And then it made me really sad. And I didn't realize how attached to being, you know, everyone wants to be part of a group, you know, peer pressure that I had, that I had put, placed on myself. And then having this successful man look at me as an equal, put me in a space and say, it's okay. Weeks after, I just kept milling over, okay, what is it that I'm fighting with that's not allowing me to just be fine with being me, you know? So I learned from that that I had a lot, to, I had a lot of space to grow in just loving myself, which is very strange because I was in a fab trip of loving myself. Turn up and I was like, okay, I've got a long way to go, but in the best way possible, you know? And it was fab seeing, like, I always love to have black, um, people on my team and like even before I got in was sitting down talking about food talking about, you know things that like as a young black person seeing old uh, elders or black people bestow knowledge in a safe space I was just like okay this is what my life should always look like this is how my set should always look like I just had a lot of rejiggling and reconfiguration to do once I left but it was all positive it was almost like someone had shone a light onto areas that wouldn't have be lit up if I was in other spaces. When you're experiencing an insane amount of racism at all different levels, it kind of like shocks your system. Like the rainbow circle of death on a Mac screen when you open up too many Adobe software. That happens. So you come home thinking your mum's going to be your Norton and clear out the virus. When instead she puts this really cheap sticker on it and goes, I'll pray. So you're just left there feeling isolated unseen, unheard, and then you have to pray to someone who says he hates you because you're gay anyway. Thank you so much. Um, I think what you're saying is powerful. And um, Simon, what you all said is really powerful because Simon, you, you're you the master behind the scenes who's, who's creating this story and pulling everybody together. And obviously what 
makes for brilliant visual content um, is the emotion, honesty, truth. But also there's an element you've got to protect people because you know, once you put your story out there, it is out there. And for those of us who are very conscious of being black in a space that comes at us for anything, and we're in the time of cancel culture, what were the things you did to kind of have in place that what you need is honesty, what you need is emotion, what you need is the brutal truth. However, you also got to be careful of the people that are you're um, inviting to come into your safe space, knowing that this is going to go out on a platform like YouTube to the world. I, I call, um, I, I realize that uh, making uh, documentaries in the way that I make them. I, I, in fact, I don't even call them documentaries. I call them portfolio films because I think that what I do is just, uh, uh, I put portraits um, on television or on, or on a cinema screen. That's, that's what I do. But um, also I think that there is something really powerful about the way we as black people tell stories, the way that we tell stories to each other the way that we listen to the stories of our elders, the way that we listen to the stories of our children. Um, and um, so for me, um, when people come and sit on that box that I've, I've named the Griots box, yeah? And for people watching this who don't know what a, a Griot is in some African cultures, the Griot or the Griot or Griot, was the uh, storyteller uh, in the village who basically kept, kept the stories of the villagers alive um, and passed those on from generation to generation to generation. And I really feel that when people come and sit on that box, and it's, a, it's not just with this show, but for as many years as I've been interviewing people now in the shows that I've made, um, people come and sit on that griots box and it's almost like the ancestors come through them uh, and the ancestors are like, well, we never got a chance to speak freely, so we are going to allow you to speak freely. And people tell me all sorts of things. And, you know, I get phone calls after an interview, people saying, damn, I had no idea I was going to talk about that. Oh, I'm going to talk about my family. I was going to talk about my addictions or whatever it was. But those things never, never appear on screen. Yeah. Those are, we, we find ways of telling stories, our stories in a way that um, allows people to their honesty, but also protects them, you know? And I, uh, I find that as a huge responsibility. Uh, I think it was um, Jesse Williams um, once said to me that he, he sees me as like the custodian of the culture. And, you know, that was a really powerful thing, you know, for me to wear on my shoulders, but I understood it when he said it. And for me, it was what was really important was to create and facilitate um, a means by which we can tell our stories on the largest platforms. And uh, so when I spoke to YouTube uh, and they were like, look, we want to work with you on this story. Um, you know, I, I just thought that, you know, it's like there, there is no other platform bigger than YouTube at the moment um, where we can allow everybody who has access to YouTube to watch this story. So it's huge. Um, but also at the same time, like I said, what's really important is that uh, each person gets to celebrate themselves, tell their story in the way that they want to tell their story in an authentic way um, and not feel like the story is being uh, hijacked by me because I have an agenda that I want to promote myself or whatever. Um, so this is really about their story uh, and, uh, and allowing them to tell their stories in an authentic way. I think what's... Um... I think that's amazing. Um, what you're also doing, and everyone who con has contrib contributed to this series, is rewriting history. We're taking into control. I'm saying we like I was in it and like I made it, but I'm part of the we, even this conversation, so I'm part of it. Um, we are taking back the narrative that has been told, taken from us and has been dictated and told by somebody else. So uh, there were some themes that came up throughout the series that um, I want to touch on, but definitely, 
why is it in it's a very basic question but i like i want the answer why is it important to rewrite and take back our history i'll start with you simon and i'll go around the room um in, in my last show uh, they've got to have us i got to meet some of the older statesmen of filmmaking people who had made a film one film yeah they made a film when in maybe in the late 50s, early 60s, early 70s, and they were never allowed to make another film, yeah? Um, and for me, what was really interesting about speaking to those people was why they became filmmakers. They became filmmakers because they realized that film has been used as a propaganda tool to tell stories about black people and to present us in a way that is not us, it's inhumane. Um, so when I, when I, two years ago, when I uh, got the second chance of living by beating cancer uh, and becoming cancer free, I made it my, I, I understood that I was given, the ancestors had allowed me to live, um, to allow us to, um, to tell our stories in an authentic way. Um, and, you know, that's, that's my life's work now is to uh, allow or to create stories of black people that show us as the human beings in a humane way or as the human beings that we are. Um, thank you. And Campbell, you know, taking pictures of us, that's not necessarily documented in the right way all the time or they're attached to political themes, violence, the struggle. So create, creating beautiful images of us is another way of recapturing history and changing history. What does that mean to you? And why is it important to change history for yourself, the work that you do? Um, it's like, I, I still remember being in like year, let's say year nine at school, doing a history class, doing a history lesson. And they're trying to teach us about roots and about slavery. And I was all here for it but I kept asking questions. I was just always a curious person to my own detriment, you know, always being, you know, in detention and told off at home and at meetings and stuff. But I just couldn't get my head around it because of being blessed by having to go home to Ghana and come back to England, throughout my childhood, I was, un I didn't, un unbeknownst to me, I was experiencing different worlds simultaneously. So although I grew up in England and I'm learning English history, I was also learning Ghanaian history at the same time, just by listening to my parents. So then when I came of age and I was able to have my own vacation and I was just really confused. I was, very, I was a very angry teenager and I didn't understand why the things that I've been told by people who love me are being wiped out or not seen in the places where I should be getting the hardcore information from. And then it dawned on me that if I had seen some of the things that I have created thus far in my short career, if I was six years old, my life would be a very different space. I would have a lot more confidence. I would, I know, just, you know, I'd be unbeatable. And I feel a lot of my generation were just told, you know, get to school, do this and move forward. And by creating the images I create and being part of things like this, it's telling the six year old me the, um, 13 year old me in high school that I know this history is correct and we are proof we're living it's not just an anecdote here and there it's not just slavery there's more to being black than the history books allow us to see and I think already it's changed I'm only 28 but I'm already still learning and it bugs me that I'm learning things now I'm like damn I should have learned this when I was like seven and all these things wouldn't have happened but then in, in turn I just feel like I'm more of a messenger to pass through things now that when my time's over, then that kid who's born won't have to have those conundrums and those conflicts because little old Campbell and Simon and Vernon and everyone else is just like put all these little nuggets for them to come and, you know, digest when they're around. Thank you. And Vernon, you, you work with some of the most amazing, beautiful, phenomenal women and people and doing their hair, recreating their look. and what's you know I'm literally twins with Lupita Nyong'o and uh, we both look alike she's amazing looks like me but what's in what was very standout for me 
the fact that Lupita has become like an, a global beauty in a world where that would never happen not too long ago, that an, a visibly African woman with short natural hair. And I think that look that you created at the Met Gala that was inspired by those black and white images of African hairstyles, black women especially have struggled to be confident in wearing our hair without judgment. And, you know, especially back in my day of having natural short type 4C hair, you, you needed to have some mix. You needed to say you had Indian in you and have some sort of looser curl for people to accept that you're, you're some sort of beauty, beautiful. So again, you're recreating history with the work that you do and especially with working with natural hair and presenting women in their natural beauty and manipulating the styles to arc back to our, to our history and our original roots. Again, the history conversation, re, um, reclaiming history, why is it important to you for the work that you do? So yeah, thank you for your question. I, look, we, I don't want to get too emotional because I get so emotional talking about this because I recognize that I, um, so I was raised in a Rastafarian home. And so my mom is from Jamaica, my dad is from Grenada and they're both were born in the respective islands and came to the UK and actually went back for college and came back again. And so all I was ever exposed to um, was a sense of self that came with so much pride. Uh, the Rastafarian culture that I was uh, raised in had so much pride in who you were and how you carried yourself. And a big part of that conversation was one with their hairstyle. And so whether you had it in braids, locks, twists, natural, in terms of it being an afro, there was always a sense of a, a deeper conversation about your hair really almost leads into how you then think of how you are that day. And so with that in mind, I almost was almost perplexed through this sort of process that you went through to kind of have that style done to you in terms of the pain and torture and the time that it would take. Um, and then when I stepped out into, when I stepped out into the world, it was a whole different conversation of what I was seeing versus what I knew. Uh, and for me, my passion ended up being, and my curiosity ended up falling in the hands of me doing hair. Um, and I, constantly was conflicted by what people were saying versus what people wanted versus what people needed and also the lack of knowledge on all parties and so I just spent most of my younger years while I was training self-taught questioning the why like why are we having this hypocrisy right in front of us and no one's really having a conversation or no one's actively doing something to shift the narrative and so I realized I had a very unique point of view in the West End salons where I was in Oxford, Street, uh, in Oxford Street in central London, uh, which is the heart of where a lot of people come to for inspiration. Um, but there was a very small opportunity for black people in particular to come there and have their beauty redefined in a way that made them feel as opulent as their white counterparts. And so I became, amongst many, many other people that were around there, um, household names making particularly black women feel great in however they wanted to wear their hair um, and in the process of doing that relaxes were a big part of that moment many 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 years ago but I would still read it we refrain from relaxing the hair too straight I would almost texturize it and then blow it out and still so you still had that sort of natural essence to the finishing and all my clients that I used to do that on 20 plus years ago still talk about that moment that was I was helping redefine what their beauty was. Um, and then the rest is history. I just know that we spent way too long feeling um, down on ourselves as a culture because of how we've been led to believe in who we are. And I know, I know hand on heart that our hair is a big part of that. And we've lost the ability to see the strength, the beauty, the versatility, the glorious, the natural shine. Uh, that we possess from within uh, and it all starts from here if you don't know that you're beautiful everything else is just just fluff and so you have to know what you have is good enough and if you are not willing to sit within what your beauty is because everyone's beauty is different as well you know we use the word beautiful it's so loosely put out there and actually I'm a redhead ginger guy and so I've always stood out amongst my counterparts uh, and that's also been something I had to struggle with myself because of society but redefining and identifying what your beauty is allows you to be your most beautiful and that's what I've been helping do with hair texture. 
Thank you so much. And um, Shadira, coming to you, I mean, your little powerful voice has rocked the nation, the female nation, the, you know, the conversation with feminism, how we present ourselves as women and women. And also, as Simon mentioned, you wrote a book using Igbo. It's also redefining the history of how Africans are presented to the world. So you've got Victoria Beckham and Oprah celebrating a book written in a Nigerian language when, you know, again, I have to harp back to just not too long ago that no one was admitting that they were African. They were hiding that identity or not standing proud. So what, what was it? Why, why did you decide? So now I'm going to change the narrative. Women are not going to wear bras by force. And I'm going to present my culture to the world in a way that people are going to have to understand. Because also another thing is that we're mistaught history, as um, Campbell mentioned. We don't, we, we, we get taught a certain version of history in, in school, right? And it's not the true history that we know. So just wanted to get your thoughts on why you are redefining history with the work that you do. Thank you for those kind words. I feel like so much of the policing that black women experience is completely anchored in anti-blackness, whether it's shaming black women for having saggy boobs or shaming black people for speaking broken English or not having a smooth British accent. I remember being younger back in the period where nobody wanted to be African, we would refer to anybody who had an African accent or twinge to their British accent as a freshie. And that was a negative term used to make fun of someone. And so for me, choosing to write a book that contains Ibo proverbs links to what Simon was discussing earlier about ancestors and passing down messages and where I'm from in Nigeria, as an Igbo person, we use proverbs to not just educate each other, but to also remind each other of the values that must never leave us in this life. And I really wanted to bring that to the world because it's something that I was raised on by my Nigerian mother. And I see that there are so many things about my culture that can never be translated into the colonizers language. And I believe in preserving that. But at the same time, I love sharing my culture in a way that allows other people to see themselves in the world because regardless of what color we are, we're all still human beings, but it is painful and shameful that even though we're all human, the fact that you have dark skin will make you less of a human being. And I feel very proud that, I don't wanna say my work has transcended my blackness, but I think that my blackness is what has led me here. And I like to believe that wherever I go, my blackness will come with me whether that's me choosing to embrace my hair in an afro, whether that's choosing to write a book that's written in English and Igbo, or whether that's simply choosing to just show up unapologetically and not be afraid to upset gatekeepers, because that's another thing that I noticed that many Black people in positions like ours start to encounter where we talk about, you know, we need more Black people in the room and we need to work to get to those rooms and we hopefully change it from the inside. But often what happens is that by the time you get to the inside, by the time you make it to the table, you've had to change yourself so much that you don't even have the confidence left in you to make the change you intended to make. And so that's something that I hope will follow me, the tenacity, the courage, the bravery to show up and demand what's mine and not be afraid to stand in my work as a black person because the world doesn't go anywhere without us, without our creativity, without anything that we do all of our labor, all of the things that make us what we are inspire this world. So we can't move anymore with fear that if we choose to advocate for ourselves that nobody's going to want us. Earlier you mentioned the word we, uh, when you spoke about we are doing this project. And it's something simultaneously that we do as black people. Once we see something, we acclaim it together because we identify. Yes. And that is the part of the success here. And we are doing this because we haven't been able to identify. And so the power is in identifying and having representation, which we all know we speak to. But as we just articulated in real time, you already feel a part of this project because there's a reflection of one of your personality traits in there. And that is the power of redefining and continuing to tell your narrative, whatever that may be, you have to pluck up the courage. I always say, turn your fear into courage and stand in it, sit in it, lean into it and stir it up. 
I can assure you that someone else will be able to mimic the nuance of what you're doing and you will help someone find their life. And that is what we are all doing. And especially through the nuance of hair texture, which is a huge part of the Black community, yeah. the existence. Uh, and we, we have internally also for the, for the longest of time um, spoke down on ourselves about the way the kinks and the coils work. Uh, to help us feel like most strength and beautiful men have also done the same to black women and so there's a lot of like hypocrisy around the language the dominancy um but the, just the whole just the whole culture and so we have to internally have those conversations as well uh, mm. for us to be respected externally and some of that is happening more so than ever before uh, and i think it's really important that we identify um that beauty is from within and we keep trying to say that, but no one's really believing that. If you carry yourself with so much grace, no one else is going to question anything else. It's how you carry yourself. 100%. Um, 100%. And uh, Simon, so we're, we're talking about beauty, we're talking about internal and internal beauty, but also the external. This has to look good. We have to look good on screen because we are beautiful. This needs to be lit well. We need to present well. So a lot, the, 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 the films that have got, the, the episodes have real strong visual styles unique styles, you've got your griot square, you've got the graphics behind, some of those graphics in enhancing the emotions that your um, subjects are feeling. What was your thought process behind that? How this has to look? And yeah, so just some of the editing decisions and stuff like that you thought about. Well, that's that's a great question. Um, my, my I've, I've arrived at a place where my, my documentary style gets copied a lot, um, so, I thought, okay, let's do something here which really celebrates black culture. So I wanted every one of the contributors in this show is is standout. They're they're beautiful people in their own right, yeah. And what I wanted them to do is to look like they're sitting within a Kehinde Wiley painting. So that's why we have the pattern in the background. That's why we highlight them in the way that we do. We shadow them so that they that it really frames them in the light. Um, because I, I think that I think it was a great David Lynch that once said that um, he didn't understand why documentaries have become ugly, and I don't understand why they become ugly as well. You know, I think that as a photographer, and Campbell can attest to this, yeah, um, is that when we when we take pictures of people, we're taking portraits of them, yeah, and that portrait becomes a mirror of of that person to somebody else. So basically, one thing that I want to do with the with the programs that I make is for for somebody to sit there looking at somebody else who they never thought they, they had anything in common with, but suddenly they're mirrored with that person. Yeah, and they're finding out that they have more in common with them than they ever thought. You know, that's the that's the basics to to the work that I do. Let's understand. Yeah, absolutely. So what's my, I kind of want to squeeze 20 questions into one. Um, YouTube is that platform that breaks down barriers, right? It, it, just because of the fact that if you can't go through our mainstream platforms, which we have been denied for so many reasons, we can circumvent and go via YouTube, via other platforms, just by getting our message out there. So this is, this, this is, I think the importance of this being on a space where there's no paywall and people can just watch it and get the message. What do you guys hope, um, if this series does one thing because of your involvement, what do you hope it does, who it touches, how it touches people? If you can give us like a sentence or like a, a quote that we can use as a quotable. Um, just that kind of thing that you hope that your participation in this project, the difference you hope it will make in some way. I'll start with Vernon. Um, well, that's a very loaded question. I, 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 I know that there will take away many things. I guess um, the two or three things that I know I spoke to, uh, I hope um, and I'm confident actually that uh, people in general will leave with a broader perspective of, of, of sense of self um, and to have compassion and empathy before they place their judgment on whoever or whatever, for whatever reason, uh, specifically in, in, in action to sexuality uh, and blackness. 
and then hair texture and along with femininity and what that really means. Um, and those four, four things, I think, uh, play a big role into a lot of the, the destruction that we are constantly up against in, in today's world. Uh, and I hope my contribution has um, provided uh, some context uh, for you just to have a little bit more empathy before you place a, a negative judgment on oneself. Um, again, it is a loaded question. It's hard. There's many things. I would like a lot of people to take from it. The main thing is, I think, I go back to, you know, knowledge is power, education is key. And for my entire life, I feel like I was fighting for others to understand me. And I feel like participating in a space like this, even my nearest and dearest, will get an insight into myself and the world that we are coexisting, that we may know nothing about. And that goes outside of race, that goes outside of um, gender. I hope when people see what we've spoken about, see the multitude of us that one, it's okay to be you. And also two, it's okay for others to be them in, in themselves. And to, to almost get a sense of freedom. Cause I feel like a lot of my blackness growing up had a lot of rules, had a lot of cages, had a lot of no's. And yet I still push through a lot of those things. So even at my own detriment and resulting in mental health and other issues that, you know, before a lot of our community. So I hope what people take from this is a sense of freedom. Cause I already, from just the snippets I've seen, it has unlocked a lot of issues in me in a happy way. So I hope people get a sense of freedom and joy. Just know that it's okay that others exist. Thank you, um, Jadera. For me, I want my involvement in this to encourage any black individual who is watching this to be bold enough to know your worth and be brave enough to act on it because most of us stop at the know your worth part, but the acting on it is where the challenge lies because there will be sacrifices that will come with acting on your worth and you will disappoint people, but you're not going to live a life that is fulfilling or that reflects the true value that you're worth if you are pleasing others before you please yourself. So for any black individual who's watching this, like know your worth and act on it. Thank you. And finally, Simon, the creator, the director, the producer, um, of this phenomenal series. Uh, you've already done some really powerful, impactful work, and this is just another string to your bow. Um, what are you hoping? What are you hoping that, how do you want people to react to it? How do you hope people react to this? I saw something this morning and I posted it on my Instagram. I'm gonna read it out because I think it sums up your question really well. It simply says, one day you will tell your story of how you overcame what you went through, and it will be someone else's survival guide. And that's what I think this, this show will be for a lot of people, uh, through everyone that's taken part. Um, I think you will be the mirror uh, that people hold up to themselves uh, for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, that's what I hope this will be. Thank you all so much for discussing this amazingly informative, provocative and much needed series with us. And you can see The Outsiders on YouTube from the 4th of October. And if you have enjoyed this discussion, the BFI is a charity organization and details on how to donate will appear on your screen shortly. This has been a BFI at home discussion in association with YouTube. I'm Akwia Jamfi, founder of the British Blacklist. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>